Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back. We are back for another Sierra Club of Southern Maryland Group Forum. We are excited tonight. So I want to welcome you to the uh, Sustainable Land Use Forum. We've been anticipating this forum uh, for about a month now. We're excited to have you here with us tonight. So let's get started with a few norms for our forums. Um, first things first, we are live on Facebook on the Maryland Sierra uh, Club, the Southern Maryland Sierra Club group's uh, Facebook page. So if you are chiming in from Facebook, just want to let you know that there are going to be poll questions throughout the uh, duration of the forum. So if you have, you want to respond to those, please put that information in the chat box. Also, if you have questions regarding um, any of the topics that we're discussing tonight and you're on Facebook, please, please, please add those into the chat box as well. Also, also um, if you are here with us on Zoom, um, I would like for you to use that Q&A feature here in Zoom to add your questions there. Of course, we'll have poll questions that will appear on your screen throughout the duration of this forum. Please answer those. We'd love to engage our audience throughout the duration of this forum, get your feedback, ensuring that you're, uh, you're here with us for the evening and you're fully engaged in this conversation. Um, and I'm ready to get started with this wonderful uh, panel of uh, folks here tonight. And I'm gonna start just by introducing myself I am Teresa Ball. Um, I will be your moderator for this evening. I am a member of the executive committee for the Sierra Club uh, Maryland chapter. And I'm gonna pass this over to Ms. Rosa Hance and she will introduce herself. Hey everyone, uh, this is Rosa Hance and thank you Teresa for moderating this evening. Um, I'm Rosa Hans. I'm the Maryland chapter chair of the Sierra Club. I live in St. Mary's County, Southern Maryland, the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway people. And I'm really excited to talk tonight about sustainable uh, land and what that means for Southern Maryland. Um, and, and not only what it means for the land, but for the water. I'm a water person, love kayaking and um, you know, just being at the beach and that's a beautiful part of Southern Maryland. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Bowen, jump right in. Hi, so I'm Greg Bowen. I grew up in Calvert County on a farm on the Patuxent River and uh, out of college, I started out as a young farmer. Um, I ended up in planning though. I started out, I was on the planning commission when I was 22. And before too long, I was hired as a staff person with the planning office. And after 20 some years, I ended up as a planning director. Um, I retired from county government in 2011 and migrated my way eventually to the American Chestnut Land Trust, where I'm executive director, where we have a, uh, regenerative agricultural farm. We have 22 miles of public access trails through deep woods along the Chesapeake Bay. And we have, we're very active in conservation and stewardship of the land. Thank you, Greg, thank you. And next up, Mr. Uh, Colvin, Commissioner Colvin. Thanks, Teresa. It is an honor to be here. Thank you so much. My name is Eric Colvin. I am a county commissioner in St. Mary's County. I represent the southern part of the county. Um, I'm just happy to be here. I will preface this by saying that I am by no means an expert in sustainable land use. I'm here more to learn and to listen. And anytime I get to have a conversation with Rosa and Greg, I learn a lot. And so it's great to be here. And I'm just incredibly proud that of the relationship that the Sierra Club has in St. Mary's County, the work that they do, because it's a strong partnership with our parks department with throughout the county. And then the fact that the chair of the Maryland Sierra Club is a resident of St. Mary's County. That's just awesome. What a point of pride for us. And so Rosa, it's great to just uh, have you here too. And to be on a panel with you, that's kind of awe inspiring to me. So thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner Colvin. And last but certainly not least, uh, the one and only Commissioner Coates. 
Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Teresa and the Sierra Club for inviting me. I, I look forward to this engaging conversation. I know it's going to be quite engaging. Uh, sustainable land use is important to all of us. Um, so I, I appreciate your partnership. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, oh, a little bit about me. I grew up in Charles County, right here in Charles County. Teresa, uh, Mr. Colvin, Commissioner Colvin, Colvin just spoke about the chair being part of St. Mary's. Hey, we have the vice chair right here as part of Charles County. So thank you so, so much. Um, and I appreciate it. Look forward to the conversation. So I'm not the vice chair of the Sierra Club of Maryland, but <laughs> I am an executive committee but, member. So I- an Executive committee, thank you. Thank you for that correct. I just gave you a position. Thank you. No, I, I like appreciate that. Thank you. Maybe <laughs> it's maybe it's something to aspire to. Rosa is a uh, <laughs> trust me, she is a pretty much of a powerhouse. So thank you so much for that elevation. So tonight is definitely going to be an education thank for you. us all. <laughs> so we have to have a really sophisticated uh, topic here. Um, it's rooted in a lot of technical things, and I think that this conversation would be um, extremely dynamic. Um, it's going to be interesting. So I, I want to welcome our listening audience to engage in this conversation. Uh, pose your questions as you like. Um, first of things, first things first, uh, you got this first poll question. Where are you hailing from? So what county are you chiming in from? We'd love to hear about that. Um, looks like most of our participants so far are coming in from St. Mary's County and about 50% uh, from St. Mary's County. We have Calvert. We have 22% from Charles. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And then there are others. There are others. So what other counties are represented here? Please put your uh, information in our chat box. I'd love to give you some shout outs while we're uh, having this forum. So let's start by talking about what is sustainable land use? So we have a little bit of a working definition. I'm going to read a definition that I found and I'm gonna punt this to Greg and let him frame this conversation around what sustainable land use is. So here's what I found. Sustainable land management refers to practices and technologies that aim to integrate the management of land, water, and other environmental re resources to meet human needs while ensuring long-term sustainable ecological system services, biodiversity, and livelihoods. That's a mouthful. Jump right in, Greg. So yeah, that I think it. I think that's got everything. It's got the whole kitchen sink in, sink in there, uh, and I'll give you a working definition that's a little little more simple, and it's more human defined. In that, I consider it um, sustainable uses are those that support humankind without adversely impacting the lives of future generations. Now it sounds very human oriented, but if the environment is destroyed, that adversely impacts the future uh, the humans that would be living here. So if you want to have a real quality life, you need all of those things that you were talking about. Um, and so you have to plan well and you've got to, you have to live with the land as it should be. And uh, so with that, but I think though, it's easier to say what sustainable isn't and I've got some slides that I would like to show you. All right, so let's talk about that. How do we know um, what we're doing is not sustainable? And I would love for you to kick that off and use your slides to walk us through that. And welcome, Anne Arundel County, I see you. Welcome, welcome. Just more. Okay. So your slides will be coming up momentarily. There you go, Greg. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna give you examples of what I believe is not sustainable. And maybe one of the best examples, sadly, has been what's been happening with Ellicott City in the last five years. Um, of course, the town was built very close to the river, which over the long haul has been very problematic. But since then also, a lot of impervious surfaces, we're talking about asphalt, pavement, driveways, rooftops have been built around Ellicott City such that um, there's no place for the water to infiltrate. 
And instead, when there are storms, you have sometimes these horrible situations that happen, a raging river running through Main Street. Um, the next slide. Because I think, I think of maybe uh, Howard County as a more urban county than Southern Maryland as a whole. But then I was kind of surprised and shocked to see that in some of the storms we've had in the last five years, that our own roads have been um, covered with water. I never would have thought that Route 4 would have become impassable by too much rainfall. Uh, but here you see it at Route 301 and Route 4. Um, road was blocked for six or seven hours at that location. And then we had a storm more recently where there was five feet of water um, on Route 4 south of Dunkirk. Next. Yeah. And I was going to say, I mean, we've seen that happen in St. Mary's County as well. We have indeed. And yeah. And then there are the major storm events. Um, Hurricanes where there have been direct costs have increased 11 fold since 1980. Just that recently, an 11 fold increase. This according to the National o Oceanic Atmosphere um, Administration. This is um, a storm event that happened in the Bahamas several years ago. It's so devastating that most of the islands uh, have still have not recovered. And imagine the difficulty in getting insurance in situations like this. In many cases, you can't, or places have been hit so many times by the storms that the insurance companies are refusing to insure them. Next slide. And then we are seeing major changes in weather patterns. I remembered a, 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 a report 10 years ago that said, that the East Coast was going to get wetter and the West Coast was going to get drier. Uh, that was from actually the USDA, US Department of Agriculture. And in fact, we have seen that on the East Coast. We've seen in the last three years, we've seen two years with 70 inches of rain when the normal is 43. And the Western states have been drier. And by consequence of higher temperatures plus drought conditions, and land management issues, we have seen Western states on fire. More, more um, fire storms, worse conditions, and more impacts. The next slide. And then we have the Arctic and Antarctic. We're seeing uh, so many glaciers that are melting and permafrost is fine. Now, what a conundrum. Permafrost is supposed to be permanent, and yet many areas we're seeing the, the actual the land collapsing as the permafrost thaws, releasing tons and tons of carbon, which further accelerates um, the change that we're experiencing. Next slide. But there's something special that, um, that the Nature Conservancy has found about our own region. If you will look to Southern Maryland, and then you look to the key, the most resilient lands in Maryland happen to be in Southern Maryland. Uh, the darker the green, the more resilient the lands are. Now, when Nature Conservancy did this study, they looked at soils, they looked at elevation of the land, they looked at, at existing conditions and the potential for wildlife habitat. And they found that we have so many microclimates in Southern Maryland due to the uh, varying terrain and good soils and soil elevation, we have the conditions for resilient land as, as the climate continues to change. This is both- Greg, this is really interesting. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you on this, but I've, yeah. I've never seen this before. This is fascinating. Um, just a quick question. When it talks about resilient, is that meaning that our area is more able to withstand climate change impacts or that it's more able to bounce back from the negative things that have happened to it? Just trying to get an idea of what this is saying. 
Excellent question. For both, for both humans and for wildlife, it's more able to uh, be resilient when storms occur. Okay. And I'll just tell you that in a very simple case. Um, where our lands are uh, on the bay on, um, near west of Prince Frederick, east of Prince Frederick, the land changes a lot. And you can see one place where that's 10 degrees warmer than another place because of the forest or the shape of the land. And so you create these little microclimates where if, if, a, with, if, a, if an animal can no longer tolerate where they are, they can move to a different climate that suits their needs. Likewise for us, because of the elevation of the land, and again, because of the, um, the, the good soils that we have here and the forests, et cetera, we can be more resilient here than in other places. It's a comprehensive study and it was just released this past October. So go to Nature Conservancy Resilient Land Mapping and you will find some very interesting information. Um, so it's a blessing and a responsibility because we have this opportunity to keep this place a very special place from an environmental standpoint, and also a place where we can raise food in case of, you know, storm events, in case of pandemics, which we've experienced, in case of war. This is a place so that can actually produce its own regional food. These, this is a special area, and it's one deserving of protection. I like that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So I learned a lot in this. So impervious surfaces, too many impervious surfaces, that's an example of what is not sustainable. Um, and we talked about um, as a result of too many impervious surfaces, we're seeing things happen um, where we're not able to bounce back or protect ourselves from issues of flooding. Um, and we talked about, um, I think that uh, Commissioner Colvin actually jumped in and Rosa jumped in and talked a little bit about flooding in your areas. Can you talk a little bit about that and how this is, how you're seeing the effects over in St. Mary's County? Sure. So one of the hot button areas in St. Mary's County is McIntosh Run in Leonardtown. And it's um, from a government perspective, it's somewhat challenging in that it deals with the town of Leonardtown itself. Uh, the state, the county, there's a lot of different groups involved, but we've had, especially in the larger rain events that we had last year, flooding that's always happened, but it's happened to a larger extreme, and there's a lot more of it happening now. There's areas that have flooded that I've never seen flooded before in my life. Um, it, there's a lot of factors that contribute to it, not just one, um, including, I was told, a beaver dam that broke further upstream that really impacted it. And I, the beavers were protecting us for a long time and, and the loss of their dam really negatively impacted everything downstream. Um, but it's, a, it's not an easy problem to fix, nor is it a cheap problem to fix. It would have been a lot cheaper to avoid the, the things that led to the problem in the first place. Wow, so what yeah. is causing this problem? What's leading to the problem? What, what's happening that's actually causing the flooding to occur? Rosa, did you want to jump in on that, on that question? Sure. I mean, I think this is a definitely a multifaceted um, answer. So, I'll, you know, I'll kind of start it off, but feel free to jump in, uh, folks. Um, we are seeing the conversion of a large tract of farmland and forest land into development um, communities with roads, a lot of impervious surfaces, um, and, and yards uh, that don't have the same kind of ecological benefit and, and stormwater management benefit that long grasses or, or, or you know, full cropland and with cover crops and um, sequestration of carbon as well as just catching all that water, right? If, there, if you're talking about, you know, vast acres of grassland that is highly treated with, you know, chemicals to keep bugs and whatnot away, um, that's, that's no longer serving the purposes that 
meadowlands, wetlands, forests, SERS. Um, and that's one of the biggest upstream contributing factors, right? Um, and and like Commissioner Colvin said, uh, you, you don't necessarily know, you know, there, there are obviously some things that you can do to predict, but on, on a large scale, you don't necessarily know how bad it's going to get until you pave something over and then you find out and then it's a little too late. Um, and um, I also thought I'd, I'd bring up, there's another area in the county kind of, well, it's in, it's in our district, Eric, um, mm -hmm. over at the, um, the Great Mills Road where it intersects with Indian Bridge and Flatiron mm -hmm. Road. Um, and it's kind of a nexus of, of a couple of different areas. And, um, you know, it's gotten to the point where after, after heavy rains, I don't bother trying to go into town. Now, obviously, everyone's been staying at home a lot more than we normally do over this past year anyway. But, um, you know, the road will be closed frequently enough that if it's been a really bad rainstorm, a lot of people are like, eh, forget it. Um, or, you know, having to drive around um, to find some other way out of your <laughs> community. Um, I don't know, in, uh, in Charles County, are there, are there also some areas like that, that, you know, that you can kind of immediately think of when you think like, oh, constant flooding? Absolutely. Um, we have, we've had unprecedented, and I think it's been across the country, as a matter of fact, unprecedented rainfall. And these rainfalls have put car, car dealerships underwater on 301. We have never seen any type of rainfall like that to put a car dealership underwater uh, on a major highway. Uh, we also have seen low-lying areas um, having unprecedented flooding, uh, putting uh, people's homes and mailboxes underwater. So, uh, you know, I know we, we we're geared towards climate change and impervious surfaces, but we've seen unprecedented rainfalls and, and it just cannot absorb, the ground cannot absorb this kind of rainfall. So yeah, we've seen, seen these um, flooding areas and um, you know, definitely we're not, we're not new to this and we're not exempt from it, trust me. Charles County has seen their share of, of rainfalls and floods. So let's talk about how, um, and I think we talked about this in a little bit of the education in our pre-meeting, um, that we talked about how trees um, and that resilience that you're talking about, Greg, how that really plays into protecting us from some of this flooding or even being able to bounce back from some of the flooding. Talk about the role that trees and the greenery, um, and we saw that, that nice map from the Nature Conservancy where we see all of this green where we live, and we're, that's a benefit to us. Tell us how that really plays into protecting us from flooding or um, not being able to uh, bounce back from that level of flooding. You know, trees do amazing things. And the interesting thing about a forested area is it, it almost costs the government no money to, to service it, uh, but it provides tremendous services because a tree for one thing takes up gallons and gallons of water a day in the summertime when most of the bigger storms happen. Uh, but those root systems, they are just the stormwater management in many areas. They just, they just take it up, the, the, the uh, leaf mass there absorbs the first half inch or, or sometimes up to two inches. It just soaks it right up and holds it there. Um, so there's, there's so many things that forests and meadows do in terms of serving as our stormwater management that if they're taken out, they have to be replaced or you have bigger problems. And it costs a whole lot more to replace that stormwater management uh, than, than those trees that are, that are just sitting there and growing. But they also provide, yeah. um, they uptake uh, carbon carbon sequestration, they put that in the ground, they clean the air, um, trees and, and they're a great uh, economic tool. And that's very true in Southern Maryland that has so many trees and a lot of uh, lumber mills that turn the, the sun and the water into revenue for Southern Maryland. <laughs> if you've had to go to Lowe's to buy lumber lately, you know how much they're worth too. Oh wow! Right. So, so trees sure. really are like a filter. So it sounds like trees are yeah. kind of a filter for for these issues. Go ahead, Rosa, please. Yeah, and I, I feel like there's there's kind of two 
two big uh, arenas that, that we should be thinking about trees and one trees as forest land, which I feel like, you know, is, is very clear, right? It, it makes its own habitat. It has its own ecosystem. I, you know, t we're talking about microclimates here because you have a whole universe of interconnected species that are just living in the forest. Um, but the other area that isn't maybe as talked about because maybe because we're rural, you know, we have a lot of rural uh, space in, in Southern Maryland is, is the urban and suburban tree canopy. You know, in the town centers, in the, um, in the commercial zones, having tree canopy is very valuable for all the things that we're talking about. Um, for flooding, uh, you're gonna see a lot less flooding in the parking lots and areas where there's big, uh, you know, big trees interspersed in between things. Um, you have tree-lined streets um, that provides not only the stormwater management area uh, aspects, but also uh, the shading to avoid the urban heat island effect that keeps everyone indoors in the summer, um, you know, because it's, it, it, there's no, no place to cool off. Um, and so, you know, trees, um, you know, we should be preserving forests. That's part of, you know, sustainable land use is preserving intact forests. Um, and we should be making sure that we're being very intentional about providing um, suburban tree canopy in all spaces of human used, uh, you know, terrain. Um, you know, the, the, the folly of, oh, you know, I don't want too many acorns. There's plenty of beautiful native uh, Maryland trees to choose from that, you know, um, acorns are like the least of your worries, right? <laughs> Yeah, so let me just to go off on that a little bit too to say, okay, tree canopies are important, but just how much? I think as we go forward working towards sustainability, we have to look for metrics that make sense because you wouldn't plant the same number of trees in a town as you would necessarily want in the countryside. But you do want, uh, there's a magic number I've heard, for example, is that towns should shoot towards 40% tree canopy. 40% is, is, is possible, particularly if you use trees along public roads, uh, as well as for little pocket parks and, and in individual on home sites. Um, if you're looking to save a watershed, make it uh, an adramous fist spawning stream, you probably want at least 60% forest, okay? Uh, if you want to have a fishable, swimmable um, creek, a river, you probably need um, at less than 10% impervious surface in that watershed. If you want a, a watershed with abundant native fish, you probably need less than 5%. So there are metrics out there that we can use as guideposts. So we're not saying we're anti-growth, we're just for sustainable growth that uses measure, measurable um, tools to make sure that we are sustainable and stay that way. So kind of related to this, um, every year MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties holds two different conferences for uh, local government officials to be able to get together and learn and take classes and network with each other, learn what Charles County's doing and uh, Calvert County's doing to help us in St. Mary's County to do things better, things like that. But they always have a book club and I always try and participate in that. And it's typically something that's some kind of self-improvement or government type thing. But a couple book club sessions ago, they did a book that was a little different for them um, by a guy named Jared Diamond called Collapse. And maybe some of you have read it. If you haven't read it, it it's a good book. It's pretty hefty. It's pretty thick, pretty dense to get through. But he takes a look at societies um, throughout history and all around the world um, that collapsed and some that came back from collapse and looking at the reasons why. And the section on Easter Island is absolutely fascinating. And 
his conclusion is basically they cut down all the trees on Easter Island. Once they did that, they, they didn't have the good soil. They couldn't sustain themselves. They couldn't sustain the population. And it was very fascinating to see the historical look at this and what happened with it. And um, not an island is nowhere near as resilient as we are here in Southern Maryland, but it was it was very interesting. Wow. So, so one of my uh, thoughts about um, the flooding, um, it, it's, uh, it's a consequence of having too many impervious surfaces and a number of other factors that you guys just dis uh, discussed. But one other issue, um, and it's the big elephant in the room, and Greg, I think you hit on it when you were talking about permafrost, and the permafrost is defrosting, that's really evidence of climate change, right? So the evidence of climate change, um, which people kind of say climate change is a myth, but we're feeling the effects of it. We're seeing what's happening as things are shifting. And one big issue as a result of climate change that's really contributing to our flooding issues is sea level rise, right? So um, does anybody want to jump in and talk a little bit about sea level rise and how that's contributing to flooding? Well, I can speak on a little bit in Charles County. Um, part of what I described with the flooding, some flooding episodes, is because um, some of these properties are really um, close to waterfront, uh, Potomac River, um, and that we have seen that sea level, that unprecedented sea level rise. And not only that, as it rises, it also starts washing people's property. So we have we've seen that a lot of washing, and then we've seen it come in so far inland that is also causing other issues with you know killing the, the trees and killing uh, uh, forestry and grass. So because it rises and, and then it sits there um, and uh, and kind of right things away. So you know to that to your credit there, yes, um, and we've seen the sea level rise and uh, with these uh, of course with these unprecedented rainfalls, climate change and rainfall. So uh, absolutely, we do see that quite a bit in Charles County now, and particularly those properties along the the waterway. If it's not eroding the ground is certainly going into the yards um, of these properties into the onto the ground if, into the forestry area and onto these into these properties so absolutely yeah so sea level rise is a real thing right so we're seeing that happen in, in our, our uh, stormwater systems and, and our, our natural filtration systems aren't able to handle it so yeah climate change is real. Let's move on to our next question. I really want to talk a little bit about why this is important, especially for the Southern Maryland region. I'm generally speaking, of course, and specifically for Southern Maryland, why this is important and how it's affecting us um, and some of those very specific things that matter to us. So, um, Greg, did you want to jump in and start talking about the importance of this? Um, one of the things I know you said was that we are green, just naturally we're green in Southern Maryland and we haven't cut down all of our trees. So that's a big, um, that's a big uh, contributor uh, to protecting us from some of this. And why is that important? Tell me why that's important in terms of um, natural disasters, farming, uh, communities, and, and the impacts on us. So, um, you know, we, we do have a bit of, a, of an oasis here. And, and it's interesting how the three counties we've always kind of uh, been together because we share a lot of the same histories in terms of coming in from the water, access to the water, access to fisheries. Um, and of course, that's the reason why we were one of the first areas that was colonized, because we have uh, a temperate climate. We had we had trees and we had good land uh, and we were we were protected from from the ocean uh, by the bay. So it, it was just like the first reason why, you know, St. Mary City was first put here. Good deep water um, access and such an abundance of fish that Captain John Smith said, if you open up, up put a frying pan over the side of the boat, a fish would jump in it. So <laughs> just imagine that. And they, the shellfish that were just uh, many places the oyster beds would actually rise up above the, uh, the sea level. So uh, it is such an abundant resource that we have here that we really should treasure it and monitor it and be careful. I mean, like I say, 
I'm not anti-growth, but I think we need to grow. To, we need to grow in a way that everything is in balance, um, that our resources are there for us, for food, and for the wildlife, and for our children to be able to experience the same beautiful place that we experienced when we were growing up. Uh, so it's a responsibility. Commissioner Coates has said multiple times that um, that there is a delicate balance between uh, sustaining a comfortable existence as humans and as we would like to live our lives and balancing that with our natural resources that we so, we've been so blessed to have here in Charles County and in St. Mary's County as well as Coward County. Um, I know some good news, there's some good information about Charles County that I'd like to brag on. Um, and I think that this was something that you actually pointed out, Greg, you said Charles County is the top three in this in the state in terms of forested areas. Right. Yes, you know, a lot of people look from from 301 or five or four and say, Southern Maryland is developed, but it's got a lot of rural there too. <laughs> and it's, if you're just looking from the road and that's all you see, you're in for a real surprise. If you just get up in an airplane, uh, if you look at aerial photos of Southern Maryland, you see just how wood it is. We have the largest area of, decid of uh, deciduous trees in Maryland, for example. And yes, uh, uh, Charles County is in the top three, uh, vying with, uh, with Garrett and uh, Allegheny counties, which are considered mountainous counties that there's hardly any farmland because it's such steep slopes, and so it's almost all wooded, one would think. But Shout out to a lot. for breaking rights, right? Exactly. <laughs> now, St. Mary's and Calvert a little bit behind, but we're still in pretty good shape, too, from a forestry standpoint. Go ahead, Rosa. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I've heard it described before that Charles County is kind of the lungs of the D.C. region because of the shape of the forested area. It almost has like a lung type shape. Um, and, and I would be interested actually to kind of overlay the forested areas with the resilient areas that you showed us on the Nature Conservancy map and kind of see how some of that, um, you know, how we can see these things just by, um, you know, kind of using our, our Google Earth and, and whatnot <laughs> to, uh, to, to see how the, the greenery of Southern Maryland is in fact kind of keeping us whole. Um, and I guess I, I think I should maybe, you know, mention that despite being, you know, Southern Maryland being so green, we're also the fastest growing uh, in terms of population areas in the state as well. Um, and so the question like, uh, you know, kind of Greg is posing here is how do we do that in a way that we can continue to live here, that we don't become like a boom and bust because it becomes unlivable because of the way that we're developing land. Um, I know something that uh, is like one of the basic principles of the smart growth uh, philosophy is that communities should be planned to be um, accessible in terms of walkability, bikeability, um, easy, easy pedestrian access between the places where you live, work, and play um, to minimize the need to, uh, to expand or destroy uh, intact, um, intact ecosystems to, to preserve what we can and, and to focus our development energy on redevelopment to reimagining spaces that have fallen out of, you know, good use and, and try to reimagine the places that we believe that we can use more effectively than, you know, however, uh, however they're being used. Um, an example that comes to mind in, in St. Mary's County um, that, you know, we, we have a couple of properties along Route 4, or, no, I'm sorry, not 4, um, Route 5 in that area that was highly flooded over this, um, over this past year. And, you know, we have a couple of properties that are kind of dilapidated and, and, and haven't, um, you know, haven't been used and are not in good repair. Um, and there's been a lot of construction in other parts upstream. Well, what about how are we incentivizing the reuse 
of dilapidated structures that we can avoid to the to the greatest extent possible the destruction of uh, natural resources. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'd love to jump in if I, yeah, if I Commissioner. Sorry. So I, first, I want to say yes, <laughs> uh, Teresa. You're exactly right. It is a delicate balance um, between infrastructure and and um, and forestry. So and thank you, um, Greg, for pointing that out and pointing out that Charles County uh, is uh, in the top three. So we're proud of that. Um, Charles County also is 51 percent. Um, uh, 51, over 51% 50, of their properties in preservation as well. So we're proud of that too. Uh, as well as we also just established a climate resiliency board. Um, so, you know, so there are a lot that we have to be proud of. Um, but yes, for reuse, and my district in particular, um, in Indian Head, uh, we, uh, uh, I'm so honored to be a part of um, the mayor there who is actually reusing a lot of their uh, property um, they are, and they have two storefronts. And so they're actually reusing this property, revitalizing, re-renovating re this property um, instead of uh, going out to, to establish and build more. So that we're very, very proud of. And as much as possible, what we try to do is to reuse uh, property that is uh, no longer uh, viable um, and, to, um, and just to revitalize it. So, you know, exactly. We tried our best to do that. Thank you, St. Mary's as well, but we also, Charles County, do our best to try to revitalize and reuse property, as I mentioned, and uh, in particular, Indian Head. Um, and uh, Brian's Road as well, in my district, Brian's Road, I'm gonna speak of them. Um, we have a shopping center that went pretty much ghost, <laughs> it was like a, pretty much a ghost town there. Um, they have um, found a way to, um, uh, I guess revitalize that area and bring in businesses, bring businesses to that center where there used now. Well, well, there was no businesses as of um, the collapse, I guess, in like 2018 when we had a, a, a severe collapse in the economy. So we're proud and, and to say that there's a lot of revitalization and reuse of property. Yeah. So just to jump in, also, um, it's such an excellent topic and point um, that we could spend hours and hours on um, reuse of older properties and revitalization. It's there's such key things and it requires a couple different things that it, it requires one somebody who's willing to take on the project because it's a challenge to do that. It's a lot harder to revitalize something than to build something from scratch from the ground up in most cases, most situations. Also, it requires a lot of collaboration um, in St. Mary's County. One of our one of the things I'm so excited about is our passive park that used to be an old housing development called the Flat Tops right near the base there. And the partnerships that have gone into that Sierra Club is very familiar with it and is very active in helping to guide what this park is going to become. Um, and just I'll, I don't think he's on the call, but I'll brag on him. Our Recreation and Parks director, he's a wealth of experience he's an old sports guy he's he's all about sports and stuff and he told me he is so excited about this park and just it it's going to be such an incredible place it already is and it, it but it's a a great example of government reusing something but then also um we've got a restaurant down in the southern part of our county called pier 450 brand new phenomenal beautiful incredible menu um a high class, high quality food. And they took an older restaurant and revitalized it and redid it. And it took somebody with passion and drive willing to go through the government bureaucracy to change the restrictions in order to make this a viable place um, to change restrictions and dealing with the septic in order to do something that was logical. Because for whatever reason, there was a law in the books in St. Mary's County that you couldn't run if you owned an adjacent piece of property, you couldn't have your septic system on that adjacent piece of property, but being able to change that so she could do that makes this a usable um, property that in, instead of tearing down and building someplace else, and, and it's really a good success story. So we've got the success stories out there and we just need to continue to encourage them. We're looking right now at a tax incentive for um, predominantly some older areas of the county that if people put in 
a certain amount of money, then their property tax will maintain, will stay flat. It won't increase when they improve their facilities so that we can encourage revitalization of areas that need it versus building elsewhere and building up the road somewhere. So there's, there's a lot that can be done. Sorry to monopolize here. No, 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 that's great information. That is awesome information to incentivize repurposing and, and renovating yeah. and not building new. Um, that is smart growth in itself. That's we're growing businesses. We're doing economic development. We're encouraging folks to come to our area and to dwell with us in a responsible and respectable way. Um, that's, that's wonderful information. Rosa, did you want to, did you want to add to that? Oh, I, I thought that that was great. I mean, that that's exactly, you know, um, creating, m making sure that, um, like, as Eric says, right, you know, we, if, if if our if our um, government is is bureaucracy is set up in a way that hinders redevelopment and advances destruction, then we've got it backwards, right? Like right, we right. want to make sure that it isn't always cheaper to just cut everything down. You know, like that that shouldn't be ever cheaper, right? It, that, that there should be um, some some ways and, and you know we have a variety of different protection things I, I, I hope that we can kind of get into in more detail but th that's a that's a great example of you know creating incentives to, to make it um, to make it attractive um, for um, business owners and investors to make our area more beautiful more sustainable and and a, and a place that the community can be proud of and I think there's a there's a uh, an important uh, factor here that um, that I don't think anyone has blatantly said is that really protecting the integrity of what we have here. So being able to manage that in a, um, in a way that protects what's valuable and that's a way of life. So um, people don't, people aren't flocking to, to uh, Southern Maryland because they want to live in DC. People aren't coming here because they want to live in New York city. What we have to offer is valuable to people who want to live here and want to be in, uh, in a Southern quasi uh, urban quasi rural setting. And there's some value in that. And I think that managing that in a balanced way and protecting the integrity of that um, is what we're all seeking to do. How we do that, um, you know, Commissioner Coleman, I think you're, you guys are on the right track with ways in which you do that with um, incentivizing folks to not only rebuild, repurpose, but um, we wanna welcome folks to enjoy what, what the very thing that we enjoy here in the Southern region of Maryland. Um, I know that there's some other valuable things about uh, land sustainability that's happening here. And I wanted to highlight those things and give um, um, particularly uh, some of you an opportunity to highlight some of those things uh, in your counties or in your district um, one of those valuable things that uh, just came out in the news that uh, I believe our governor was here talking about in St. Mary's County was that great 1634 fort um, that you guys just uh, dug up over in historic St. Mary's. Commissioner Colvin, did you want to brag on that? Oh my gosh, it's just absolutely incredible. They've been looking for it for so long and uh, they found it and it just it's we have such a rich historical legacy here and um to kind of shift back slightly to what we've been talking about, it, one of the things that struck me throughout this conversation is a lot of times we're talking about the same things, but we use different language with it. And so a lot of times people who align more on the left like to use um, smart growth and, and certain terms that people sometimes who align more on the right won't use, but people on the right will use the terms, we wanna preserve our rural legacy. We're talking about the same thing. We want the same quality of life where our kids can run around safely outside and enjoy this beautiful place that we live in. And if you haven't been down to historic St. Mary City, it's a phenomenal place to take your kids. There's so much history, so much to see. They've really done a good job with trying to expand how they tell the full history of Maryland and St. Mary's County. And um, it's, it's, it's a really neat thing. And you're going to be seeing a lot more from St. Mary's City 
over the next couple of years as we build up to Maryland's 400th anniversary. So it's keep your eyes on it. There's a lot to come. Still. Greg, please jump in. You're muted, Greg. I think you're muted. <laughs> when it comes to uh, our history, there, there's, a, a, of course, a, a very big economics factor to that. When people are flocking down to see that new fort, they're also stopping at restaurants or staying at hotels. They are contributing to the economy in ways that many times economists don't pick up on. And uh, we've done some look in Southern Maryland at all of the economic valid, uh, advantages of things that they don't usually show up on the scale from uh, that economists would look at, such as heritage tourism, ecotourism, and agritourism. But in fact, in Calvert County, our biggest tourism assets are our agritourism and heritage tourism uh, uses. Look at the Calvert Marine Museum um, and listen to my dog. <laughs> uh, look at the wineries, the breweries, and I'm going to have to yeah. stop right here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can help pick up because I, I, I know exactly what you mean. And, and um, our area is really rich in all of these um, outdoor, um, nat you know, nature, farming, aqua, agri-tourism aspects that, um, that I feel like we were also really, really lucky to have um, over the past year. Um, when our yeah. lives have shifted so many things have gone virtual. So, and and, and especially in the very beginning, um, when when around the country people were experiencing really strong food shortages, supply chain issues, to know that there are local farmers and farm stands, and those farm stands opened back up again, and we had we had um, those resources, and and that local circular economy that can sustain itself is is in a resilient economy as well perfect timing rosa because our farmers markets open up this weekend full steam ahead so come on out to our st mary's <laughs> county farmers markets and get some good food there and that's that's an excellent um an excellent uh, piece of information to throw out there because that's a a valuable portion of our economy here in southern maryland farming as a matter of fact uh commissioner uh, bj bowling had a, a forum yesterday to talk about diversity in agriculture. And there are a number of persons in the Southern Maryland region who are really engaged in the farming and agricultural space. So um, I know that there are some, some uh, things that uh, Southern Maryland has done during uh, COVID to uh, protect some of our uh, availability of food resources. Anybody wanna speak to that in terms of farming and farmers markets during COVID? Uh, um, Teresa, I can speak on uh, part of the, uh, not only farmer's markets, but who's been instrumental def definitely in uh, uh, supplying food, um, you know, to, to our communities during COVID. Um, but, in, and I can also speak to community gardens, which I'm very familiar with, because I, I think uh, I just heard Rosa mention about gardening and agriculture. Um, and, uh, and speaking of economics and, uh, and we, we, talk briefly about Malice Bay before. That's another economic driver, part of our economy here in Charles County. Um, but yeah, we have, we have uh, industry, uh, industries that are um, bringing, bringing in community gardens for sustainability. They wanna make sure our young people, if anything were to happen that, you know, perhaps, you know, we, go, we didn't have grocery stores or grocery stores closed or we have another pandemic that our young people know how to sustain, uh, eat and feed themselves. So uh, we have a, a lot of community gardens. And speaking of diversity, there are a lot of uh, um, different cultural groups that are putting these gardens together, buying seeding and, and planting their own uh, vegetables and uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, this is great. It's probably the time is probably no better timing than now um, to, uh, you know, certainly open up the economy and agriculture and, and uh, invest in our ag and aquaculture. We have 18 miles of waterway in Charles County. So, you know, we, we're looking, we also had the Waterman's Association to do a presentation in reference to oystering and crabbing. 
Um, they did mention something kind of grim. Those who like Marilyn Krabs, they are going, they're going to be on the rise. They're, the price is on the rise. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, that is going to be costly to uh, purchase crabs uh, as much as we'd like it here in Maryland. But it is a, a booming economy in reference to uh, eco ag uh, ecosystem uh, when we talk about agriculture, aquaculture um, uh, area. So yeah, thank you. That's excellent. So let's go ahead, Rosa, please. Oh, I was just going to share. And, and this is where, you know, um, thinking about how, you know, the, the prices rise when, when demand is up and, and, but, and prices also rise when, when we're scarce, right? Uh, you know, and so we have to be constantly taking a look at that balance, right, of um, what's happening in our rivers, what's happening in our bay um, that are contributing to these different fluctuations in, in marine population and, and making sure that if we have a, you know, a plentiful harvest uh, of um, you know crabs, fish, oysters, all you know everything. Um, one year that we don't necessarily take it for granted and just assume, oh, oh, they're back now, and we could just you know fish as much as we want. Unfortunately, you know we're no longer in those times of of total uh, you know kind of reckless abandon bounty. We have to be really careful because we are numerous and um, we can overfish, we can over farm, we, you know, we can overdo anything that we do. And so that's, that's kind of the essence of sustainability of like the not taking more than you need, the, the like subsistence and, and being, being careful and thoughtful about um, how, how we impact the land and the water around us. And I think we're seeing a wave of that. Folks are going into uh, sustainable land use uh, methods with farming and using farming and agriculture as a way to protect not only our local economies, protect their families, protect the soil. Um, and I think that uh, even Sierra Club actually are starting, you guys are starting a, a community garden over in um, in St. Mary's County. And there's going to be- In the Passive County. Park there. Yes. And uh, yeah. I was out there with uh, some of the Sierra Club people seeing the plans for it. And it's absolutely amazing what they're looking to do there. And uh, very excited to see that come to fruition. It's going to be a really- Good thing for the community for the park it's it's going to be really really nice so we're going to have one of those i believe in charles county as well so that'll be coming to uh charles county and we also have miss uh bonita adi who's been in the uh, agricultural space for about 30 years here in charles county as well who's been doing great things with our youth and teaching them about sustainable land use and ways in which they can uh create their own home at home gardens and uh, sharing community resources. So big shout out to her and the work that you do. You're much appreciated, ma'am. Greg, did you want to speak to the farming and agricultural use over in Calvert County? Okay. Before he does, let me brag a little bit about this guy and um, the uh, American Chancellor Land Trust. If anyone has not been there yet, you should go. It is beautiful. And, um, you know, that's where a lot of inspiration, I know that people who go there are inspired by not only the amazing trail um, trails uh, whole system in that area going all the way out to the bay but the gardens um, right when you come in and you park um, you know and and so I don't know if that's what you're going to talk about Greg but I just in case if you weren't going to brag I had to point that out <laughs> thank you so much um, so yes we've been trying to raise uh, food very sustainably, they're using regenerative techniques without uh, commercial fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, uh, with very good success. And it's a great experiment, but we have lots of master gardeners that work with us, trained through the extension service, and uh, people who love to grow food and um, love to help others uh, because we raise it and we donate it to a uh, food pantry and um, and so the folks there that pick that pick up from that food pantry get the freshest best food because it goes from our farm to that table where it's uh, distributed in about an hour. So it's pretty cool. But uh, there are there's so many great ag operations that are that are happening now. We're seeing a rebirth of of really more sustainable agricultural techniques. And, and younger farmers, as, as the public appreciates sustainability more and more, 
As I've mentioned, uh, uh, Next Step Produce in Charles County is like an amazing operation. Uh, and they, uh, and the Tomets there raise food that, that I'm fortunate to get because I get it through Chesapeake's Bounty. Because Chesapeake's Bounty is a county, uh, Calvert County operation that aggregates and distributes food from throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. So I'm, I'm lucky because if I go to Chesapeake's Bounty, I get to get, you know, the, uh, uh, the greens from, from Heinz. I get um, vegetables from uh, Sassafras Creek Farm in uh, St. Mary's County. Uh, of course, they, they also sell oysters and crabs there. Um, and these are the kinds of operations where you keep more of the dollar, the food dollar, in Southern Maryland. We actually, um, every time you go to a grocery store, and grocery stores are great because you get things that you don't get elsewhere. But that dollar, when you spend it, it leaves immediately. When you uh, uh, buy it from a farmer, that dollar recycles several times in the community because a farmer went to a local um, feed store to get certain products and um, had to have the tractor repaired, and that's a local function. There's so many things that happen when you are working with local farmers. And because of the local food movement, young people are coming back to the farm because they see hope. And uh, I, I'm excited by that. And I'm so, so happy that in the summertime, I can almost eat all locally. What a cool thing to do. And it, it would be great to see young people really getting into the land, um, sustainable land use movement by getting involved in farming and agriculture. Um, and hopefully that, you know, in the Southern Maryland region where there are farms, where uh, parents are getting older, grandparents are getting older, that we'll see more young people who believe in in uh, protecting our land and the use of that land uh, for generations to come. So speaking of protections, I'd really like to redirect our, our, our conversation a little bit and talk more about protections and talk about how do we conserve and protect our land here in Charles County? Some of the ways in which you guys have already maybe done it in your respective jurisdictions, ways in which uh, the Sierra Club is advocating to protect or to, to continue to protect or um, innovative ways, things in which you thought about. And to our viewing and listening audience, if there are ways in which you believe that we can uh, talk a more innovatively about protecting land, I'd like to hear from you. Please, Greg, go ahead. So let me just say, um, land preservation has been a major part of my life since 1976, when I worked with Senator Bernie Fowler, he was commissioner then at the time, to set up a local transferable development rights program. Over all of these years, I can tell you with confidence that a person that preserves their land does not lose equity in their land or in their overall uh, income because the land preservation programs offset the price that a developer would pay for that land in combination with the residual value of the land. It gets complicated. And I'm not gonna spend the time today, but I could show you physically example after example where uh, to prove that the land preservation programs retain equity in their land. I will give you one story. And, uh, there was a farm in Calvert <laughs> County. The owner no longer wanted to farm. And so they, they decided they would subdivide the property themselves. And so they subdivided into 26 lots. And then they auctioned it off to the highest bidder. Calvert Farmland Trust bought that property. They unrecorded the subdivision. They put it in an ag preservation district. They ended up selling it back to a farmer and they got all their money back. Think about that. That is proof in the pudding. And as a matter of fact, one of the properties that ACLT owns, where my office is, where that little farm is that Rose is talking about, that was a recorded subdivision. An American Chestnut Land Trust bought that property, 
unrecorded the subdivision, sold the development rights, and got his prop money back. So there's so many examples. It seems counterintuitive, but preservation not only benefits the big community large, it also benefits the ag community and the property and the individuals. So one of the things that in St. Mary's County, the commissioners are always uh, cognizant of is being strategic in the way that we go about doing it. So making use of the rural legacy programs, but pairing that with whatever county match is required, but also with repi funds from the base, being able to make use of the federal money that comes in the base money and to, to just get the best bang for the buck with any uh, land preservation that we do and that we've had some good success with that. So that's one thing that we always try and keep in mind as we go forward with this. I know, and Charles. I think that. Um, go ahead, Greg. I just, I just say, I just, I absolutely think that's a wise thing to do. And I'm glad to see the counties all participating. I love the rural legacy program because it's so flexible uh, in terms of where the revenue comes from. And also the owners have a choice how the easement is written. Now it may affect just how much they get for their easement, but they have choice to tailor it the way they want it to be. It's a great program. Please, Commissioner Chapo. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, speaking of rural legacy, Charles, Charles, we've expanded our rural legacy um, to include uh, a few more um, areas. So we're, we're really proud of that. I, I hope everyone takes advantage of it. So um, it's a great program. Um, we also have the REPI program as well um, with some other, um, but I wanna also mention that Charles, we also an advocate of purchasing open space, um, open what I call open green space. So we do, we do purchase a, lo a lot of that um, and um, you know, which, which is great. So that comes, that helps with the preservation of a lot of our uh, property as well. Um, and then we have a lot of farms. I understand we have about probably 350 some farm, farms or farmers uh, in the county. Uh, I also like to um, extend that uh, when I talk about that community garden, uh, Mr. D is ad, is a, a advocate of uh, these young people. I wanted to mention that of teaching young people sustainability. Also, oystering. She also is, is putting together a oyster gardening to teach young people how to harvest oysters. So we call it oyster gardening. Um, but these are all sustainable um, uh, ag and aqua um, uh, areas that that we all can participate in. So um, I, you know, I appreciate Greg you you bringing this topic in and Teresa. So great. Charles County is, is definitely a participant of. I want to talk, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about rural legacy before we move on and talk about any other issues. The reason I want to talk a little bit about rural legacy, because I think that this is a very valuable program. Um, and, and I think it's maybe in some cases, um, not as understood what conservation easements do and how they, how they help or support. Um, so, um, in Charles County, um, St. Mary's County, as well as Calvert County, there are uh, rural legacy programs. And the way that the programs work, from what I understand, and based on my research and understanding of it, is um, we uh, propose uh, rural legacy areas um, based on uh, the amount of contiguous land that we can, the greatest amount of contiguous land that we can find. We present that proposal to the states, um, to the state's uh, Department of Natural Resources, they approve it and they set aside money that we can use in our specific counties to give back to landowners um, in, in, in a way of purchasing uh, a, an interest in their land to ensure that they will preserve the land with some conservation um, principles behind it. Um, there are some ways in which that these the landowners can balance that with being able to build houses for their children or future children or people who are in their family and ways in which they can use their land. But the ultimate goal is really to preserve the rural legacy and the integrity of what we're talking about here today in terms of land sustainability. Um, does anybody want to talk about the value of that and how, how this program is growing either in one of our counties? I know that Charles County, it's, you know, we're expanding for the Nanjamoy Matter Woman area. Um, and these debates get really hot. And heavy, and you know, it's it's not always a sexy topic to talk about protecting land. Um, and I'm putting that out there tonight. Like, it's not always 
um, the best conversation. Everybody has their views about it and how it works and what, what the balance is and the right way to gain the balance. But um, the Rural Legacy Program, as I know it, and of course I'm new to Southern Maryland, I'm a city slicker. So if, if there's something um, about these programs that are not valuable that you don't see, um, please, I, I'd love to hear about that or talk a little bit more about the value of um, specifically, specifically the Rural Legacy Program or conservation easements in general. I know Greg, you've been very integral in uh, in uh, in Calvert County and in some of those easement programs that are not necessarily rural, rural uh, legacy, but other programs. You want to talk about some of those and the benefit? Sure. Um, Southern Maryland is fortunate in having a number of different options, ways to preserve land. Uh, each of the county has had its own land preservation program, often involving a transferable transfer of development rights from one area to another part of the, of the counties. The Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation established a program in 1980 to preserve prime farmland tracts. And a lot of land in Calvary, Charles, and St. Mary's has been preserved on you know, all the great farms along the Patuxent River and a, and a lot of farms along the, uh, the Bay areas of the, you know, the, the flat lands where, uh, where the Delta soil is built up and it's good, healthy soil. These, a lot of these have been preserved through the Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Program. And the actually rural legacy came late in the game because the concern from the state was is that there was too many isolated properties preserved and that there were so many ecological advantages to having one large mass of land. So rural legacy was established to try to pull all these disparate properties together in a link and create great wildlife habitat areas too, which also then eventually equates to great um, water bay resources because when you have healthy land and healthy watersheds, you have a healthy bay and a place for crabs and fishing and everything else. So all of things, all those things come together with the Rural Legacy Program and uh, it's, it's the most comprehensive tool we have. Okay. So, so Rural Legacy really is a way to, um, to protect, but um, there's been some debate about the value of it and how it, how it really uh, supports this notion, but it does really support the notion of protecting land and ensuring that we are, um, we're able to, um, to sustain what we, what we, we pride, our, pride ourselves on here in Southern Maryland. Okay, so um, I think that there's another um, area of protection in terms of, or actually uh, speaking to protections. And I think Commissioner Coates, you spoke about that earlier um, and ways in which we're protecting ourselves or trying to protect ourselves. We talked a little bit about the, the Charles County Resilience Authority, which is going to have their first meeting in, the, uh, in May um, and really talking about ways in which we can protect land and protect and restore our, our, our um, any, well, any issues that we see here in Charles County as a result of climate change. So um, another area that we talked about, and maybe we could talk a little bit more about this, Rosa, I wanna give you an opportunity to jump in and talk about protections and um, from the perspective of the Sierra Club, we said smart growth, and I think Commissioner Colvin had it right. Smart growth is a, uh, uh, maybe a, uh, it's a little bit off center in whatever direction you feel you want to swing it in these days. Um, yeah. So the term itself is not something we, we'd like to hear, but really it's exactly what we all want who live here. So please, if you want to talk to that. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. The, um, the, the term uh, I think was born a, cup, a couple of uh, Maryland governors ago uh, before I arrived in Maryland. Uh, originally, as a, I arrived as a Terp. I was a turtle at first, no, uh, at the University of Maryland. Um, but uh, the, you know, the term has kind of uh, grown and, and encompassed a lot of different policies that I totally agree are, are part of what we are all, you know, aiming for it in, a, in, a, in a lot of different um, in different ways. I know that in um, in St. Mary's County and Calvert County, we have an adjoining um, metropolitan planning 
organization because of the census that this census designated area um, because of the population it's kind of the up to as far north as Lusby and as far south as like uh, Great Mills um, par parts of Great Mills um, it's it's a it's a census designated area that has special um, planning functions and one of the um, one of the really useful outcomes is that we are we are doing some of that active planning work. We are envisioning those sustainable communities that we are talking about, and and um, so the Sierra Club has been involved, uh, you know, participating uh, by public process and and commenting on. Um, Last year, it was um, there was a transportation-oriented plan that the Metropolitan Planning, you know, the MPO, as we call it, uh, did. Um, and currently, there's a um, task force on complete streets, which is again, you know, we use all these funny like jargon words, but complete streets is just the idea that like one street shouldn't just, uh, you know, the sidewalk should not go nowhere, right? Uh, where the sidewalk ends is a great Shel Silverstein book, but is not a, a good <laughs> You know, tutorial on how to build the community. Um, so, you know, diving into the weeds and looking at how people move around, how people get from point A to point B, um, and and that accessibility piece is is what this kind of planning is all about. So, um, as as the, as the Sierra Club, sometimes uh, we are lucky enough to have a, um, a volunteer that gets to serve on you know task force like this. Um, and sometimes uh, we just we encourage um, all of our members, supporters, and the general public to go ahead and use their voice and use their pen. And when there are public hearings that come up, whether it's a budget hearing, whether it's a you know zoning hearing, or whatever the case is, um, if there's something that you see and you and you don't um, you don't understand it, uh, don't feel shy about reaching out to us. We might not know the answers. We're volunteer led, um, but we try to help people. Um, find their voice and and express what um, what their concerns are in terms of the sustainable use of, of land and um, that's what we do. All right, so I wanted to um, switch gears a little bit um, because we're getting close to our closing time and really try to get to some of the questions from our listening audience as much as possible. Um, so um, I want to start with uh, sustainability and equity. Um, and the question here is, has there been any uh, discussion around sustainability and equity in Southern Maryland food system? As a former Russell Farms, Clements, St. Mary's County employee turned food system sustainability student at Johns Hopkins of, of the School of Public Health, I can see the decline in food system sustainability, equity and resilience over the past century and subsequent related health issues that are further compounded by other disparities a huge opportunity for improvement. So the question is, um, has there been any discussion around sustainability and equity in the Southern Maryland food system? Um, and I think we kind of spoke to that a little bit. I think that there was, um, again, uh, here in Charles County, we had a, um, a public forum with uh, Commissioner BJ Bowling to discuss uh, diversity in agriculture, in the agricultural space. Um, and uh, that was yesterday, that occurred just yesterday via Facebook. Um, and if you guys wanna speak to that in, the, in terms of St. Mary's County, because I believe the student is talking specifically about St. Mary's County. Uh, Commissioner Colvin, did you wanna jump in on that? Yeah, just very briefly, cause I really can't give this question a, a, a fully, the answer that it really deserves, but definitely, I mean, we've got some areas of our county that are food deserts where there is hard, for people to get access to real healthy quality food. And it's kind of the, we don't talk about it often, but the flip side to that is the areas that aren't the food deserts that they have an overabundance of access to the really good healthy quality food. So it's kind of a, a, a paradox in how that happens. And, and it's something that needs to be addressed further without a doubt. So I, it's not a good answer to the question other than there is recognition that it's a problem. But I do wanna also, before we run out of time, put in a plug, um, I, cause I feel that a lot of people who probably watch this and are participating in this panel want to be involved with 
helping to ensure sustainable land use in the future. And one of the absolute best ways is we are in the process just getting started of redoing our comprehensive plan in St. Mary's County. And I know that our uh, director and deputy director of land use and growth management might be watching right now. And they came before the commissioners this past week and we approved a motion that we want citizen involvement. You can reach out about our comprehensive plan, and it has a lot of different aspects about sustainable land use, zoning, how um, protection of water, um, just all of these issues. And it really helps to map out the path and future for the next 10 years. So there's, it's, a, it's a pretty involved process to redo this and update it. And please be involved with that. Please reach out about that because there's a, a lot of room and a desire to have as much input as we can um, as this is developed. So that's a great way to be involved in helping to shape the future. That's an excellent invitation to anyone in St. Mary's County to really get involved in that process. The comp plan really is gonna be your roadmap for the next, what, exactly. four years, five years? 10 years. 10 years, wow, okay, that's excellent. So there's another question here um, that's coming in from the audience. This question is to Commissioner Coates. Um, mm -hmm. And this question, of course, is related to um, the Charles County Airport property. We have a couple of questions in regards to that, um, in regards to the zoning proposal um, through uh, Charles County. Um, this question is from Karen Mullins and Vontasha Sim. Um, there's a proposal for a zoning expansion in Western Charles County. And it's a 500 plus acres um, change, proposed change within the watershed conservation district. Can you speak to the May 3rd Planning Commission public hearing regarding the zoning proposal? So I, I wish I could speak a lot, a lot, a lot more about this. Unfortunately, we uh, wait till these proposals come before us, the commissioners, which they we won't see until after that particular hearing. Um, so I've asked for a briefing. Unfortunately, the briefing didn't come in time before this meeting um, of what, what's been proposed and what would go before the planning, but we try to keep it um, separate of our input or, or you know, um, or what we, you know, anyway, what we think about the planning or not um, until we comes before the commissioner board. So when it comes before the commissioner board, then we can take a better look at that. But at this time, I don't know all that's in that plan. And I think it's valuable um, to say here that the uh, comments period for that uh, proposed change to the comprehensive plan here in Charles County, uh, the comments period closes tomorrow, which is April 30th. The hearing is on May 3rd. So um, anybody who is here in Charles County as a resident or have a vested interest in our, um, in our community, um, please feel free to provide your comments um, for the record for the uh, planning and growth management uh, division here in Charles County. You have until close of business tomorrow. Um, I believe it's close of business tomorrow, um, uh, which is April 30th. And uh, Commissioner Colvin, there is a question here from you from Mr. Brandon Russell. Um, in St. Mary's, there's a 600 acre parcel on Friendship School Road, which directly affects Macintosh Run, which is a great example of how the priorities of responsible land management and development expansion can clash. How do you balance land management with bringing businesses to add revenue and improve quality of life for your residents? That's a good question. Um, that parcel, uh, just like the previous answer, it didn't get to us yet. Um, uh, I, I really am not sure of the full background and backstory on what's going on with that. Um, but it's there's a lot of concern about it, understandably. And it's something that we'll just have to really take a closer look at if it does come before us right now. I'm not sure what the status of it is. Okay. Do you have a, um, is there any open question period for you guys in St. Mary's County like it is here in, in Charles? Are you guys actively accepting comments or um, responses oh, from the public? We always are actively accepting comments. You can reach out to all the commissioners at CSMC at stmarysmd.com. Please reach out to us at any point in time. We have regularly scheduled public forums. I believe there's one coming up in May where you can get in front of the camera and talk to us, but you can reach out to us at any time. And we've, we're more than willing to talk to you and hear what you've got to say. And we encourage input. Yes, please. 
And I think there's some value in getting our constituents involved. I mean, uh, really at the end of the day, uh, these issues really require innovative perspectives, right? People Definitely. who come up with great ideas, um, nobody knows it all. We're all evolving in this space of maintaining and balancing, as Commissioner Coates says, uh, ma maintaining our way of life and balancing um, the, the integrity of the environment that we want to we want to sustain and protect. How we do that, again, takes uh, deliberation and, and careful planning and uh, thought provoking conversation. So, um, so yes, so there is, um, is there another question, Rosa? Did you see another question? Oh, I, um, I think there might be, I haven't, uh, I'm, there's, you know, trying to scroll through the chat and talk at the same time. Um, I, one of the things I was going to say is that these, you know, these past couple of questions that um, were put in the chat are, are really great questions. And, and it's the kind of, um, you know, when citizens have, um, have strong opinions about what's going on in their county and, you know, and you want to um, express it, that's exactly what these public hearings are for. Um, and so I really encourage everyone to go ahead and you know, when you see these notices come out and you see that whether it's in the newspaper or you um, you subscribe to one of the feeds in the um, county website um, and you raise them with your friends, with your neighbors, with your colleagues, with us uh, and directly with your elected officials. Um, th this public process is exactly what leads to improved outcomes and better public policy comes from people raising their voice. Yeah, Greg. Yes, Greg, please. You're still muted, Greg. Let me put on my planner hat for a minute to say uh, nobody wants to support or approve unsustainable development. I think that's fair. And I think we have a lot of very um, serious and uh, responsible elected officials throughout Southern Maryland. But sometimes it happens, and sometimes we don't even know why. And that's why I think it's very good to have measurable metrics in your plans as you're writing comprehensive plans, um, to, to be looking at what infrastructure you have and what the expansion needs might be before you grow, before you add facilities, to see that your stormwater systems can handle growth where growth is being proposed, to, to, to set up metrics so that you know the warning signs as to what the impervious surfaces are within a given watershed and what that might mean. For example, I mean, it's a pretty, Department of Natural Resources puts out pretty good metrics in terms of watersheds. They say, if you exceed 15% impervious surfaces in a watershed, it's going to decline significantly. If it's less than 10%, you can still probably achieve fishable swimmable. Um, but those kind of metrics are very helpful when commissioners are taking a look at these things because otherwise it becomes an issue of whose voices are strongest and, and where it gets very confusing as to what's right and what's wrong. And I just think that sustainability should be at the table too as decisions are made to see that the quality of our environment the quality of our life is still going to be there as changes occur and so i i think we have a lot of great people out there making decisions and they i think they just need the best input they can to see that sustainability is part of it okay and I think there's a um, comment that I want to repeat uh, or actually recite from uh, Mr. Mark Inlay. Um, he says, there's a federal endangered species in McIntosh Run, which is really important and critical that we, of course, we want to protect. Um, I don't know what this species is. Um, is this a plant or um, I'm assuming it's a plant, plant life? I, I know, no, I, I know this one. It's a dwarf uh, wedge mussel. Uh, and thank you, Mark. Mark, uh, Mark Imlay and, and, uh, and colleagues who are naturalists uh, have been such a resource in sharing 
um, you know, important fact about the, the biodiversity of our land that we might, you know, we might not know that we're looking at a dwarf wedge mussel, you know, but um, uh, it's a it's a great um, it's a great skill to have um, cool party tricks. And uh, the Federal Endangered Species Act is actually one of the tools that we have in our toolbox as to how do we or why, how, why do we prioritize certain areas to preserve? Well, it's to preserve our endangered species. So when we have um, a federally endangered species, that's, that's yet another reason that we should be talking about preserving um, that watershed. All right, guys, this has been a robust conversation and I am really sorry to cut it off because <laughs> we have met our threshold at 8.30. Um, there's so many other things that we could talk about that we didn't touch on tonight. Um, and I'm hoping that we can see these conversations offline. My also, my hope is that, uh, that our uh, local uh, officials as they plan for sustainable land use, that they will tap into resources like yourself, Mr. Uh, Bowen, and really talk with you and chat with you and consult with you on ways in which we can balance, uh, create those delicate balances as Commissioner Coates talks about and uh, Commissioner Coven actually indicated. So um, before we go, I wanna make sure that uh, we uh, give our parting words to our listening audience. Um, I believe our listening audience got, um, got information about ways in which they can get involved in each of these organizations and get involved in this conversation for sustainable land use. I hope you've learned something tonight, got some great valuable information from this conversation. I hope you will continue to have these conversations in your very own communities as well and uh, challenge, challenge our, uh, our, our elected officials to, uh, uh, to push the envelope in ways in which we can be more innovative about protecting uh, the Southern Maryland region. So before we go tonight, I want to close out our uh, session with, uh, I'm going to start a sentence and I'm going to give each one of you an opportunity to um, finish. So sustainable land use is, and Commissioner Colvin, I will let you go first. Sustainable land use is. Planting a tree whose shade your children will get to enjoy. Wow, I love that. All right, sustainable land use is. Commissioner Coates. A ecosystem that everyone can enjoy. Ah, I like that. Rosa, sustainable land use is. Smart. Ah. <laughs> All right. Mr. Bowen, sustainable land use is. Possible if we all work on it in Southern Maryland. You heard it here, folks. Good night, and uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.